G'day folks, welcome to this presentation today on supporting resilience at Middle Park Primary School, Tuesday 21. My name is Tom Holmes and I'm the wellbeing counsellor here at Middle Park Primary School. It gives me great pleasure to be doing this talk on resilience to help support the families of our community and our wider community. So this was really interesting for me. I took a deep dive into what resilience was. I think resilience is one of those words we can throw around quite a bit. I know I've done it myself and I didn't really understand the meaning or what resilience was. So this has been a real eye opener for me. And this presentation is gonna take us through what resilience is, how it's built, how it's maintained in relationships. And also I've made this presentation to be really practical so that you guys have tips, tools, and techniques that you can use straight away at home. So let's begin. So what is resilience? So the term resilience originated in the 1970s and it was actually a couple of psychologists got together and they were trying to determine why some kids could overcome adversity and have more positive outcomes in life and why some couldn't or some didn't. And originally they thought that there was a resilience gene and there was an extraordinary process or an inborn superpower or that children are just inherently born resilient. But what we know today, 50 years later, is resilience is a learned skill that is built and maintained over time through relationships with the parents, the family and the community. So in sum, resilience is experience plus learning plus positive relationships. Resilience is learned by a negative experience, which is supported by positive relational learning experience. This forms the child's internal resources of resilience, being things like self-regulation, coping skills, confidence, and self-belief. This leads to a resilient child who on their own can make positive, adaptive responses in the face of negative experiences, adversity, and challenge, which then leads to positive outcomes. So resilience is really the child's ability to handle stress and stressful situations so they can calm themselves when they're feeling upset or to help themselves feel better despite obstacles and challenges. So learning resilience. So we learn resilience through experience in the context of positive relationships with parents, family, and the community. And imagine resilience as like a seesaw. And this is the fulcrum of the seesaw here. This is the top of the seesaw. And we have positive experiences on one side and we have negative experiences on the other side. So when the child has an individual negative experience, their stress response system is activated, the child has flipped their lid, they're down here. In that moment, a positive, supportive and caring adult relationship brings the system back into balance. So the regulated adult connects, calms and regulates the child. And this actually deactivates their stress response system. And I'll talk about more, I'll talk about the stress response system more later in the talk. So building resilience. So from these repeated positive relational experiences, the child builds these internal resources of coping skills, self-regulation, confidence, and self-belief. So the child really, from this external environment of relationship with the adults, internalizes these resources of coping skills and, and things like confidence and self-belief. So through these experiences, the child creates positive adaptive responses in the face of any future stress or adversity. So that next time a negative experience happens, the child can better cope with the situation themselves and they can balance their system and they can pick themselves up. Resilience over time. So if there are too many negative experiences without enough positive corrective experiences from a responsive caring adult, this actually decreases resilience. The child will move away from challenging situations. So as you can see on the left-hand side there, there's too many red blocks on, on the seesaw and the fulcrum has actually started to move over. And it becomes harder and harder for the child to tip the scale back towards the positive. So conversely on the flip side of that, when a negative experiences are outweighed by positive relational experiences with a caring adult, resilience is built and increased. The child will use their resilience to move towards challenging situations. So as you can see, it's, it's different from the first one. So the fulcrum has actually moved over there. There's more green box on the right-hand side, which as you can see in the circle are from those positive relational experiences with adults. 
that it's harder and harder to tip the scale now towards the negative. So relationships are the foundation of resilience. So between the family, community and parents, resilience is really at the heart of that. So the question is, how can we create more positive relational experiences between parents, family, and the community? So starting off with relationships in the family. So really those close relationships that the child has within the family inform the child's social relationships. So the relationship structure or the interaction of those relationships at home inform the child's social relationships and how they interact with others in their life. So family cohesion is really important. So another one I think is especially important is to look at the family as a system and each person within that system is interconnected and they each have roles and rituals and patterns of communication. And the child cannot really be looked at as independent from that family system. Now, involving your child in family decision-making and problem solving really gives them a sense that they, they matter and that their decisions or, or what they feel matters. Uh, maintaining positivity and future focus gives them some hope and optimism. A routine is really important for children. So consistent bedtime and dinner time and wake time gives them a sense of structure, even at the weekend. So rituals are really important for that bonding, for that connection uh, and belonging around the dinner table, around the breakfast table. Sleep's really important for kids, eight to 10 hours every night. Tell stories. You know, I still remember stories of my, my grandfather used to tell stories of world, world travel and, and traveling up the east coast of Australia years and years ago. And that's one of the main reasons that I'm in Australia now. I actually emigrated from the UK in 2008. And, and so that gave me that possibility and hope for this, for this better life that I could have. And to reconnect, I think this is really important to reconnect with your family of origin, with your culture, with your faith. This provides that real hope and groundedness and stability and this is really important because there's quite a few people of the community here that come from overseas or come from different countries and they're here in Australia and it's really important to to connect back uh, our roots and where we come from so that we feel more grounded in where we are now. Limit social media I think is, is a important one. So onto community and social relationships. So these are ideas to help build resilience socially and in the community. So Encouraging your child to be part of community service organizations, so activity or, or become active engagement with schools, with libraries, with community centers, to engage in community programs like cleanups and working bees or, or at the, you know, the little swimming thing down, down at the beach that often happens here, like in Port Melbourne or Middle Park. So engage them in those community programs, uh, community clubs, teachers, mentors and instructors at community clubs are and sports clubs and at the footy club or, or um, you know, at the sports centre are really important for building resilience. Those mentors and role models are great for kids. To contribute and to volunteer, like helping grandparents. I still, I, I remember growing up on my my uh, grandparents' farm and my granddad showing me how to use tools for woodwork, to, to maintain fences, to dig holes. And it was so important you know, learning those life skills, I just think they're so, so crucial and build that resilience that you you know how the world works. And you do that by really helping some of those, those people within the community and starting to actually work. Uh, so onto parent relationships. So I've broken this up into three items, which is who we are, what we display and what we teach. So who we are influences what we display and teach. And what we display influences what our child sees and what we teach and how influences what our child learns from us. So who we are. Our children's resilience starts with us. So we can't model resilience, things like coping skills, self-regulation, confidence and self-belief if our skills are not strong enough or if we cannot show them due to our own stressing. We need to be calm in order to help our child regulate. And how we cope with stressful situations today is often shaped by how we learn to cope in childhood. We do what is familiar and we can often get caught in habitual patterns, default or autopilot reactions. In some cases, we may be in constant survival mode without really knowing why or having a chance to stop and think about it. And from the uh, Center for Developing Child at Harvard Uni, 
Adults who strengthen these skills in themselves can model positive behaviours for their children, thereby improving the resilience of the next generation. So over on the right hand side there is an exercise in self inquiry. And I believe, truly believe one of the greatest gifts we can give ourselves is to learn from ourselves. Like we are our greatest teacher to monitor our own habitual patterns and find out why we do what we do. So there's some questions over on the right hand side, which, which will start to take that dive into the exercise and self inquiry there. And they're questions that I always ask myself from, from time to time. And sometimes I catch myself repeating the same things over and over. So I think they're really useful. So what we display. So we are not what we think or what we say or how we feel. We are what we do. Children learn by watching you. They see everything. How we come home from work, how we talk to people at work, how we have relationships, our social interactions, how we handle tough times and how we solve problems. So what we display, this part is really about what behaviour are we modelling and how do we want to model the best behaviour for our children because they see everything that we do. And stress spills over into our children and prolonged stress exposure reduces resilience. In one study, 18-year-olds were asked if they were given one wish, what would they change about their childhood? Their response, they wish their mothers and fathers would be less stressed, less tired. So this is really about being aware of your behaviour, model and display the behaviours that build and maintain resilience. You can do this better if you reduce stress. So over on the right-hand side are ideas that I've cultivated through my own practices and through interaction with other Peers and other psychologists and counsellors, we, we focus on, um, on ideas to help reduce stress and, and groundedness. So something that really works for me is time in nature. I love to get to the, to the beach and I love to walk around the, walk around the tan. Uh, when I can, I can't, can't at the moment, but I regularly do a, a massage and do yoga. And I just find both of those just really help relieve, relieve stress and tension in my body. And I love a coming home ritual about washing the day off and wiping the feet before entry. And this can be maybe that if you drive home from work, that you might stop the car 10 minutes you know, before home and you just compose yourself or you listen to a certain song or you do 10 minutes of meditation or mindfulness, something like that, excuse me. And you just calm and compose yourself. So you create this gap between your, between your work life and your home life. You just create this short moment of groundedness and connection with yourself so that when you open the door you just become more open and, and compassionate to whatever is happening in, in your home life. Uh, all right what we teach. So here are the three core skills of resilience. So this is the crux of resilience and that is self-regulation, connection and executive function. Now each three of these self-regulation, connection, executive function, they connect exactly with the three main parts of the brain, which I'll go through now. And self-regulation is the core of resilience. So your child learns to self-regulate from you. This is called co-regulation. Connection, we need that self-regulation in order to connect with others. And once we are connected, we can accurately hear our child and help them engage executive function. So we have to step through these layers. There's the first layer, the second layer, and the third layer, and we have to do these in sequence. So we have to regulate the, the, the child before we can connect, before we can engage executive function. So our self-regulation comes from the oldest part of our brain, which is right down here, it's called the reptilian brain. It's responsible for survival and flight or fight. Connection comes from the middle of our brain, it's called the midbrain or the limbic brain. And executive function comes from this neocortex, it's the front part of our brain or the prefrontal cortex. So that's the three main structures of the brain, the reptilian brain, the midbrain the, or the limbic brain and the front part of our brain, the neocortex. Now, when information comes in through from the outside world, through our ears, through our eyes, through our nose, through our mouth, through our touch, all information gets processed in the oldest part of our brain first. And this is responsible for fight or flight. It then travels upwards it goes through the emotional part of the brain, through the limbic brain, and into the into the neocortex. So really, humans are really designed to be scanning the environment for survival, for danger, for threat. That is pretty much millions of years ago. That's pretty much the only thing that we really had to do was to try and protect ourselves from from danger, from sa saber-toothed tigers, so we could survive. 
the human organism itself is pretty much just designed to survive primarily. So that's why all information comes through the survival part of our brain first. The problem that this has is when a child perceives something as threatening, and so the information comes in as being threatening, it sends off a signal of, of survival, of fight or flight. And so the child, that's when we see the child flip their lid. They've perceived something as dangerous. Information has come in, gone to the survival brain. It's hit the alarm and they've flipped their lid. When that happens, they lose the capacity to connect in the limbic brain and they lose the capacity to regulate their behavior, focus and learn the front part of the brain, the neocortex. So when this, this alarm system gets triggered down here from the information coming in through our senses, gets triggered, it shuts down this part of the brain here. The reason it shuts down this part of the brain here is because back in the day when we were running from saber tooth tigers, we didn't really want to stop and think and use our analytical part of the brain to go like, oh, maybe I'll just stop and run this way, or maybe he's not so scary. Because really, this part of the brain just drives our survival to fight or flee. And so when that happens, we are just flip, we just flip their lead. We, we are in survival mode. The front part of the brain has gone offline and we can't connect and we can't regulate our behavior because this front part of the brain regulates our behavior. So that's why as an adult, we have to teach our child to self-regulate, to calm this lower part of the brain first. Once this lower part of the brain is calm, we can then connect with them with the middle of the brain so that they can hear what we have to say and only then can we engage executive function. To give you a quick example of the survival brain, that's the one that is reactive and reacts unconsciously before we've even had the time to think about it. So if you imagine going to put your hand on a, on a hot pan or on a hot cup and you pull your hand away really quickly, that is the survival brain literally triggering your nervous system to pull your hand away before you can even have the time to think about it. And even as adults, when we react to something aggressively or we act, we flipped our lids, we've blown our tops, our front part of the brain still shuts down too. And you'll notice that'll take about 15, 15 minutes to about half an hour for all those chemicals that get released in that survival mode to actually calm down and compose before we can even start to think clearly. And we notice that as adults, and that's exactly the same as it is for children. So when they've actually flipped their lid, you won't be able to connect with them. You won't be able to reason with them. Logic won't work until you've regulated them, until you've calmed calm them down. You need to be in a calm state to calm your child. The reason the house is there in the bottom right hand corner is because there's a great neuroscientist, a neuroscientist and psychotherapist called Daniel Siegel. And the metaphor he uses to describe the parts of the brain is, is like a two story house and the lower part of our house is the feelings and the top part of our house is the thinking part of our brain. And all information goes through our feelings first before we can really start to think about it. So they're the three parts, the three causes of resilience, self-regulation, connection, executive function. And we're going to go through each one of them now, and I'll teach you skills that you can use at home for each of those stages. Um, just before that, this is something that we actually use in the school. This is what we call our zones of regulation. So in the red zone, the child has flipped their lid, and what we're trying to do is to calm them, to connect with them, to self, um, to regulate them, to bring them back into the green zone. So then they can feel okay, they're calm, they can be focused and ready to learn. As I've said before, if as soon as the child perceives something as threatening and their survival alarm has gone off, they've flipped their lid, they can't learn. They can't take any information in. So the main thing, the crux of what we do with the well-being at the school is to teach them those self-regulation skills so that they can learn in class, that they can take in new information. So as I said, here's um, resilience skill one, which is about self-regulation. So if children are in a stress response and they flip their lids, they need your help to regulate and calm. So again, we call that the co-regulation or relationally regulate before they can connect with you and engage their executive function. When children are upset, as I said before, logic won't work until you calm them down. So the goal here is to teach children self-regulation so they can make themselves feel better when they get upset or are in a stressful situation in the future. So these are ideas to help self-regulation. These are ones that I use all the time with kids at school. As soon as they come into my room here, we're looking to you know, give them these, these self-soothing toys so they might sit 
and use these. This is another little self-soothing toy. Um, we might put some soothing music on, music on. We might do some breathing exercises. I might increase the length of the exhale. I might sit here with them and teach them about breathing to calm them down. I've got a weighted blanket in here as well. They might put a, the weighted blanket around them so they get that sense of um, calming and, and protection. And these things all really help calm them down. So another thing is the fundamental needs met. So it's actually funny when kids um, when kids come in here, often they'll be in here for five or 10 minutes and then they'll say, can I go and get my snack? Can I go and get something to eat? And we'll go and get them something to eat. We'll come back and they'll sit here and they'll be playing with a stress ball in one hand and they'll be eating an apple in the other hand. And after about 10, 15 minutes, they've calmed down. And that, they're, they're the things that really help that self-regulation. But in that moment, I'm really thinking calm too. So no matter what they're saying or what's happening with them, you know, I'm really talking quietly and I'm, I'm listening to what they're, they're saying and, and I'm trying to be as calm as possible and I'm trying to breathe as well because they're going to be looking at me to see am I calm. And if I'm calm, well, that'll, that'll calm them. Uh, mindfulness is a really good one. So bringing attention to the here and now, such as animals, trees and clouds, rather than memories or rumination, rumination of what made them upset. One thing we do here in, in social groups is to actually ask the kids to, to lie down and they look up at the sky and actually just watch the clouds move past. Sometimes we say, you know, the clouds are like emotions and, and feelings and, and they sort of drift, drift by. So we, we're trying to say there that, that the feelings and emotions we have will always pass us by. But we're also getting them to look at something much bigger out there in the world rather than ruminate, ruminating over the, the small sort of um, thing that just made them upset, maybe maybe a tussle in the in the playground at recess or something like that. So we're getting them to focus on something something bigger picture. Um, I forgot that one there, which is find safety. So really, the human as, as an organism is really is built to scan the environment. As I said, information comes in through our senses is really all all processed through. Is it safe? Am I safe here? Is this dangerous? Is this threatening? That is pretty much what the brain is scanning 100% of the time. So the fundamental thing that as a, as a counsellor with children is, is to try and encourage them or help them to feel safe in certain ways. It's, it's a fundamental human need. So on to resilience skill two, which is creating connection. So after we've calmed them, we then, we want to connect with our children so they can then hear what we have to say. So positive, consistent, predictable, supportive and nurturing connections with parents and primary caregivers are the foundation of resilience. So we need to connect with children before they can hear accurately what we are saying and engage their executive function. So as I said, we need to regulate them, connect with them before they can engage the executive function and problem solve and reflection and, uh, and reason. So this part here is to help children feel felt, heard and seen before trying to engage executive function to solve problems. So this is in two steps. So step one is ideas to help build connection. So the crux of this here is saying, I'm here, I see you, I hear you, I understand, and I care. And this is all about body language. So we actually communicate 93% non-verbally. Physical stance, we get down at the child's level. One thing I would do is pretty much every time I go up to a child is bend my right knee, I get down on my right knee and, and I'm at eye, eye level and I just find I can I can connect with them then I can listen to them it automatically I find calms them down instead of standing over we're looking to show that I'm I'm being empathetic and I use a soft quiet tone of voice and I'm non-judgmentally listening to what they have to say and I'm always trying to put the child's feelings into words to validate their feelings to name it to paint it um, and no matter how nonsensical or frustrating our child's feelings may seem, they are important to them. So we want to acknowledge and validate their feelings no matter what has happened. The next step is togetherness. So this is all about saying, I am with you. So this is all about patterned, attuned, repetitive, rhythmic activity. This is all about reciprocity and in synchrony. So this is playing a game together, passing a ball together, turn taking, mirroring facial expression. Do you remember when you know, with, with your, with a baby or with your baby or someone's baby, we do that thing where we automatically go to make a face at them, don't we? We like go, or we go, boo, 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 and then they do it back to us, right? Because they're learning 
from us. They're learning to use these tools. They're learning to use their skills. They're learning to use their mouth. They're learning to make noise. And, you know, even as children, they still really enjoy that reciprocity, that synchrony of those facial expressions. And it shows you're connected. When you're mirroring things, when you're laughing and having fun, you're passing a beach ball to each other. And, and, and it's also at this, this sort of rhythmic activity of the same speed that you're passing the ball. It shows that you're connected with two people you're connected. And that is the main crux of resilient skill two connection. So on to resilient skill three, executive function. So here we're at the third stage. We've gone through stage one, which is to, to regulate the child. So we've calmed that survival mechanism, that fight or flight. We've then connected with them so they can hear what we have to say. We're then looking to engage the front part of their brain, executive function, the prefrontal cortex, so they can reflect, they can reason, they can solve problems. So executive, this is called executive function, this part. And the word executive equals responsibility and control. So it's from the word execute to get things done. So this part of the brain helps us get things done. And that is responsible for self-regulation. As I said, this front part of the brain controls the feeling part of the brain, the survival part of the brain. So we need this online to actually learn the self-regulation. So the quicker the child can learn to regulate themselves and bring this online, they can actually start to consistently regulate themselves. It's also responsible for self-belief, confidence, empathy, skill building and reflection, planning ahead, control of impulses and problem solving. It begins to come online between six to eight years of age and continues to grow through life. So this part of the brain, the brain also grows from this lowest part first. So when the child comes out of, um, of the womb at, at birth, they're born with the lowest part of the brain and the midbrain with the emotional part of the brain. So up until six to eight years of age, children are pretty much run from their feelings because they don't have this part of the brain. They can't empathize with people. They can't plan ahead. They can't solve problems. So they just run from emotions. So all the time when children up until six to eight are always um, prone to flipping their lids because they literally don't have this front part of the brain that actually calms them down. And that front part of the brain helps us make sense and learn from what just happened. So the goal in this part is to help your child to begin to control the way they move into challenges so they can create and enjoy more positive outcomes for themselves and others. So this is all about question asking rather than instruction, helping them reflect and think about the impact of their own actions and what they could have done better next time. And this all involves things like growth mindset, learned optimism, one thing I really like is planning ahead. So children that struggle with anxiety, you know, if they struggle with maybe social anxiety, if they're gonna if they're gonna go to a restaurant, it's asking them what skills could they use, you know, could they take a stress ball with them to help calm them while you're at that new restaurant? And then to ask them if those skills don't work, what might you do then? If you lose your stress ball, your 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 sensitization ball and you can't calm yourself, then you you lose that ball. How are you going to calm yourself then? Another one which I really focus here in the in the school is transition. These can be small transitions like you know changing a breakfast cereal or or changing something around in the house. So huge transitions for them like moving school, changing friends, going up a year level um, to you know have monstrous transitions in the child's life of of puberty um, of um, Maybe, maybe divorce or separation or, or loss, you know, death of someone within the family. These are all transitions. And so transitions are so important for children to discuss doing new things, what's challenging, and to rehearse scenarios. So when they're going to go to high school, what that, what's that going to be like for you? How, how do you think you'll cope leaving your friends? How will you make new friends? This also, some of those transitions, think about those transitions, helps with the the, the social skills and to thinking about how they're going to interact when they go to new places. And we're always looking to, to try and focus on their strengths and, and positive attributes to build those core skills of resilience. So coming to a summary here, so we're moving into a summary of the five steps of resilience. So the first step is to listen to the child's feelings with your whole body. 
So these five steps are really, if your child has flipped their lid, you really want to follow these five steps to building resilience to help them cope with their own stresses and to be able to self-regulate themselves next time. So this number one, listen to the child's feelings with your whole body. So you're regulating them here and you're connecting with their reptilian part of the brain, the oldest survival part of the brain. So this is stop what you're doing and get down to the child's level. Look at the child and speak using a calm voice. The next part here is to put your child's feelings into words. So I call this say what you see. And here we're connecting with that limbic part. We're connecting with the emotional part of the brain. So it looks like you sounding pretty angry about that or you sound cross or I can see you are feeling hurt, worried or anxious. And then help them to notice what is happening in their body. Again, we're trying to connect with the limbic brain and we're trying to help them to understand the sensations that are happening in their body. And I'll describe in just a second after this slide the difference between feelings and emotions, and that relates directly to this step three. So we're trying to get them to notice how does that feel in your tummy and in your head or your arms look really stiff and tight. So we're trying to get them to notice those, um, those emotions that are happening in their body. Step four, we're empathizing with them. We're connecting again with that limbic part, the, the, um, the emotional part of the brain. You know, it's tough when I can see how much that upset you. And then to step five, we can only after we've gone through regulating them, we've connected with them, we've done step one to four, only then can we engage executive function and help them reflect and solve their own problems and think about their actions. So questions like, what could you do about it next time? Or I wonder what would have, would have helped you better. So they're the five steps to building resilience. So another thing I wanted to add, which, which is to help your child name feelings. So this goes with step three here to help them notice what is happening in their body. And I wanted to add this emotion wheel here. I've got this emotion wheel right up in front of me here and children sit and they describe their feelings with me. So we have primary feelings and secondary feelings. And we have the primary feelings in the middle circle there. And then we have secondary feelings on the outside of the circle. And this is something really useful. You can actually pin this up on the fridge. And when your child has split their lid, you're looking literally to point or to circle with a whiteboard marker, the feelings that they're actually having. So you're trying to teach them. You're trying to build a library, like their capacity to actually understand their feelings and emotions and name them. And instead of saying just the usual ones that I'm you know, sad or I'm depressed or I'm anxious or I'm angry, we're trying to Make them more literate in their in their in their library of, of feelings that they can describe. So the difference between feelings versus emotion. So the word emotion actually means energy in motion. It's emotion. Emotions are actually the sensations of energy we feel in our body as a re result of chemical signals coming from our brain. Actually, by saying I feel fearful, what I'm saying is I'm feeling the sensation in my brain of, of the fear in my body. So a feeling is, is, is a mental, it's a mental label that we sign a cluster of emotions that we feel in our body. And emotions do two basic things. They make us move towards things like connection and reproduction or away from things like danger and threat. And as I said, feelings are different. They are the mental label that we assign the cluster of sensations of energy that we feel in our body. And so the difference between primary and secondary feelings, primary feelings are our most fundamental and a direct in, and direct initial reactions to event or situation. So their primary feelings are the initial reaction, fear, sadness, anger, disgust. And secondary feelings are reactions to primary feelings. So example, feeling guilty when angry and then turning the anger inwardly. So there, that's a tool that is really helpful for helping children to label the feelings that they're having, which connects exactly with the step three to help them notice what is happening in their body. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. So thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you got something out of it and I hope you can really take those tools away and start to use them at home. The last slide of this is some resources that I've put, which you can further look at to have a look at resilience or how do we lose control of our emotions. And that really just um, is a bit more learning, which kind of will take this presentation just a little bit 
a little bit wider. So one thing I really like here is why do we lose control of our emotions? It's such a great seven minute video and I love to show that one to kids. And there's some other resources there that I've actually got as part of my website. So thank you so much for joining me today. And I really appreciate your time. Again, I'm so grateful to be able to offer this to the, to the wider family and social community of, of Middle Park. So thank you so much.